God is good. All the time, yeah. <laughs> um, philosophical question. I'm not much on philosophy, but here's a philosophical question. And while most of the time I do not ask much of a response from you guys, okay, this time I'm, I'm giving you permission to speak out the answer. Okay? It's going to make you think, because it's not a yes or no answer, and it's not, a, it's not a Bible answer. So here's the question. What does it mean to be human? You missed the mark, okay. You're never perfect. Created in God's image. You have free will. To error. Everybody has their different idea of what it is to be human. If you were to ask people who are not religious, they would give you a whole slew of examples. If you were to ask a biologist, he would give you a whole different group of answers. And this, this sad balloon is just going to drive me nuts. That, okay. I, I really love this balloon, but we're going to put it down. Paul, here you go. You can have the balloon. <laughs> We, we are born into a body, and we'll call it a human body. And once we are born into this body, we are given something that we don't want and we don't really need, but we are given it to, it's given to us anyway. And it is something that we have to deal with until this body is no longer ours. And that is a nature to do what is wrong in the sight of God. We are, when, when we are born, it is, it is bred within us to, to be like that. I heard, uh, I heard a preacher, a preacher pass a, a preacher preaching one Sunday, and, and he said, what's one of the first words, or he asked, what's one of the first words that a kid learns? No and mine. Mine. Now, they learn, they learn the word no first, why? Because that's the, that's the word they hear more than anything else. Now, typically, they, if, they're, if, if, they're, uh, if they could work their mouth correctly, chances are they're, the, the first thing they should be able to say would be their name, because they probably hear that more than anything else. But when we are born, we don't, we don't grow, we don't sin because we grow into sin. We grow into sin because we sin. If left to ourselves, without any intervention, once we are born, we will grow worse and worse in sin. It is the nature of us as human beings. That is who we are when we are born. And that is who we stay without intervention, without there's something, some outside force that intervenes and changes things for us. And Paul talks about this extensively in the book of Romans. He talks about sin and how it can be very controlling. And he also talks about how we can not be controlled by sin. And that's what I want to look at today. 
If you have ever struggled with sin, whether it be a particular sin, whether it be a group of sins, or whether it just be not being a nice person, which is a sin. In case you didn't know that, if you're a mean person, guess what? Now, I know it doesn't say in the Bible anywhere, thou shalt not be a mean person. But it does say, love your neighbor. Also says, love your enemies. Listen, all God has to do is say, love your neighbor. And it pretty much classifies everybody. You say, well, well my, I only have two neighbors, one on this side and one on that side. Right? I, I've heard that before. I'll love this guy and I'll love this guy, but I'm not loving that guy. Here's the, I'm not pointing at you, Forrest. Actually, I was pointing at you. But here's the thing. You're using neighbor in a perspective that is way too small. Okay? Let's assume for, for a moment for a moment, that the universe is seven quadrillion zillion miles long. Which, according to science, they, they say that the universe really doesn't have an ending point because it keeps expanding. So, considering how long the universe is, would not the person on the other side of the globe be your neighbor? In reference, give you a good reference point. Everybody on this, on this earth, and we'll go ahead and throw the people up on the space station too. Because they're pretty close too. We're all, we're all neighbors. And, and yet, even, even as Christians, when we say we are to love our neighbor, why do we find it so hard to do? When God tells us, to uh, love your enemy and pray for them, why is that so hard to do? Aren't we supposed to, as Christians, as people who love God, who do everything we can to serve God, shouldn't, and, and being regenerated, that's the word that, that we read, we, we are regenerated. So why is it so hard for us to love people? And I'm using love loving other people as a really basic example of the scriptures in a whole. Why is that? It's because we need to find, and the scripture tells us what it is, we need to find a new way to be human. So I, I, didn't, I didn't get a chance to do it, but I wanted to play a video Switchfoot has this song called A New Way to Be Human. And it's, it's kind of a rockin' song, so some of you old people, older people might not enjoy it as much as I do. But uh, I wanted to play it because it... But the problem is, is that you play a song like that, some, sometimes you can't understand what, is being, what they're saying. Um, but in essence, what he's saying is, we got to find a new way to be human, a new way to live. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, a new way to live, a new way to be human. Not the human that comes out of the womb and has an inclination from that point on to sin. But a new way to be human in which we can be victors over sin and not subject to sin. We're going we're gonna to find a glimpse of the answer to this in Romans chapter 6. And as I mentioned last week, Romans is really kind of the idea. It is the idea of that is Paul's gospel summed up in one book. Now, it is not, ex not exhaustive by any means of Paul's philosophy about Jesus, what he came to do. But it gives us a clear picture of Paul's understanding of the gospel. But really it's not the story of Jesus' life. 
as much as it is the story of our life in Jesus. So you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, and you read about what Jesus' life was like. You read the book of Romans, and you find out that Paul's Gospel is about what our life is like in Jesus. Hence why a lot of people consider it Paul's gospel. It's a life of, it's a life of Jesus lived in us. Or our life lived in Jesus. So Romans chapter 12, we're going to start with verse um, thir- uh, 12. It says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give, it, do not give in to sh- sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Paul is one of those, and and Romans in particular, is one of those books that is really deep once you start looking into it. And you can't just take what you read and make assumptions about it. For instance, I will go straight to verse 14. Sin is no longer master over you. So sin isn't over, we are not mastered by sin. Why? For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Okay, so if we aren't under requirements of the law, then the law can't be a master over us. He says, instead you live under the freedom of God's grace. And we could very easily assume that because of that, that we don't have, to, we don't have any responsibility to the law. We don't have any responsibility to do what God said. The problem with that is that if we don't understand the law, in fact, if, if, you, if you dismiss the law altogether, what you end up doing is the very same thing that you were doing when you were unregenerated before your Christian life. If you say the law has no, no c- control over me, I can do whatever I want, isn't that the same thing you were doing before you were a Christian? So what's the difference? The difference, the only difference, is that now you have faith in Jesus. But is that faith in Jesus, really faith in Jesus, if it doesn't change the way you live? Paul, later in verse 15, says, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? What's the question? What's the answer? Of course not. And, and that's plainly read. But what's, what's not plainly read is why. Why can we, why do we, do we not, why can we not go on sinning? Are we not saved by faith? Absolutely. So if we're saved by faith and not by works, then no matter what we do, no matter what we do, we are saved. Is that correct? If it's by faith alone. So why do we need to change our behavior? Why do we need to know what the law is? Why, do, why, does, why is God going to write his law on our hearts? This is this is a, a, a this is a difficult. It's real easy to to lean one way or the other when it comes to grace and faith, living in faith by grace on what God has done, and living by the law. It's there's a, there's a, a fine line that many people say you have to walk, but it's not that hard. 
In reality, it's not that hard. In reality, you walk that fine line. Well, I don't want to call it a fine line because it's not really a fine line. When you accept Jesus, you accept Jesus because of faith and belief in him and you love him. And what does love produce? Well, I tell you what it doesn't, it does not produce. Love does not produce hate. And so when we hate our brother and sister, then we are not living the way God has established us as Christians. And we tend to grow in that. God's, God's concern God's greatest concern is not what sin you, com you are committing right now as an isolated event. God's concern is your eternity. That's his concern. And he is going to do whatever it takes to help you reach an eternity with him. And that is why. He wants, because he understands something that we sometimes don't get. He wants us to spend eternity within. He also understands that sin grows the same way faith grows. And so if you start living in faith and, and in that faith, doing what God has called you to do, guess what your, great, your, your faith does? Let me help you out. When you choose not to live in faith and you live in sin or participate. I don't want to say live in sin. Participate in sin. Guess what sin does? It grows within you. And that's why it's so important for us to understand that no sin is a little sin. No sin is a little sin. Because, as we know from a mustard seed in faith, what does that mustard seed grow into? A large plant. And so it is with sin. When we allow sin, any sin, into our lives, we get it to grow. So the question is, it, the question boils down to, what do we do to live the way God wants us to live. How can we live the way God wants us to live? Now, we know from last week, and if you, if you didn't hear last week, I encourage you to go back and listen to last week's. We said that we are saved by faith. And that faith gives us God's righteousness. It gives, we are right in God's eyes because of our faith. That we have that. Once you are saved, you have that. But what you don't have is a new body. You have a new spirit. God gives you this new spirit. And, and, and that spirit that God gives you lives forever. What you don't have is a new body. Guess what that new body doesn't do? That new body doesn't live forever. Why? Because its inclination from the time you were born is to what? Sin. And I'm thankful too. Because I know I haven't, I haven't put a lot of years on this body quite yet. I'm getting there. 28 is just around the corner. But I'm already feeling the effects of, of being my age. I'm already realizing that I can't jump, just hop out of bed and stand up. I got to throw my leg. Listen, I'll, I'm going gonna, gonna to show you what I go through every morning, okay? And some of you guys can relate because I've already seen you smiling. You're laying down in bed and you're going, oh, oh, is it time to get up? Oh, five more minutes, snooze button. Oh, this is, uh, oh, snooze button again. 
How many people hit the snooze button three times? Raise your hand. Amen. Uh, so when I was a teenager, my getting out of bed was like this. Oh, okay, okay, we got to go do something here. Okay. <clears throat> I've been awake for a while. I've been awake for a while. So let's, let's put a couple of years on that. do this. <clears throat> I can do this. Can you relate? Here's the, here's the thing. This body is destined for destruction and death. It wasn't made like that. When God made Adam and Eve, they made them, he made their bodies perfect. Perfect to live eternally. But we know what happened in the garden. Death came to the garden through disobedience. These bodies, even though our spirit is made new, these bodies are still destined for destruction because there's still sin incorporated into these bodies. And I can't wait because if we read, if we read the Bible and we know that Jesus was raised and he had a new body and we read what he does with that new body, pretty exciting because he's like walking through walls come on wouldn't you like to do that I would love Jeanette to be asleep in bed and not open the door but just walk through the wall and say boo <laughs> and I'd be sleeping on the couch for a week <laughs> just that just that but not only that we also know that he instantly moved from one place to the next Teleportation. Beside the fact that you can eat whatever you want and not gain weight. That's just an added bonus. But for now, we live in these bodies that are destined to destruction. And we need to understand that because it plays an important role in us understanding who and how we can be the, God, the people God wants us to be. How we can live the way God wants us to live, even though we are stuck in these physical bodies. So, one of the... Um, One of the things that I like about the Bible um, on a mobile device is that you can have mi many, different, many different Bible versions on here. And on Wednesday, I read out of the New King James Version, and um, I really liked it, the New King James Version, because with, with Paul, it helps you understand a little bit more of what he's trying to say. So I want to read verse uh, 12. Out of the, the New King Ver James Version. 12 of, of Romans 6. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. That you should obey it in its lusts. I give, you, you understand the illustration I was given about your body. Being ingrained with sin. And he's saying. Don't let sin reign in your body, even though it is, it is, uh, it leans to and wants to sin. Don't let it reign in your body. And do not persist your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. 
But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness for God. So you have this body that doesn't want to do what it doesn't want to do what God wants you to do. And, but you are to control your body and make it do, your members of this body, make it do what God wants it to do. And in verse 15, still in the New King James Version, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the ones, slaves, whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? So now Paul's getting into the idea of slaves. And we don't really understand the idea of slaves as referred here because all we think about when we think of slaves is, is people stolen from their country, brought across the ocean, and sold into servitude who have no choice. That is how we view slaves. Okay? And while that was not unheard of, especially in the Old Testament, typically... Slaves were slaves for one of two reasons. In the Old Testament, you don't really see this so much in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament, if, if Israel went against a, a, a nation, if God said, I want you to go against this nation, and they fought, or a nation came against them, and they fought, if Israel won, some of the people that they captured would be their slaves. Right or wrong, that's what happened. There's another form of slave, and this is more of what Paul's talking about. Um, this is more of a bondservant type of slave. And so it was not unheard of that people would sell themselves to other individuals. And they did this for many, for many reasons. They would sell themselves to individuals, especially if they were really poor. If you were really poor and you had no way of making money... Would it, not, would it not seem reasonable to go and commit yourself to somebody else who would feed you and clothe you, even though you would have to serve them? We do this all the time. We call it a job. The only difference is that we have a little bit more freedom in our jobs than they do. And our, and, and our focus, the focus of our job is very limited Based on, on them. When I was a youth pastor, um, and <clears throat> I, I carried this over when I came here because I thought it was a really cool idea. When I was a youth pastor, the senior pastor, when they hired me, would say, here's, what, here's your job description. And he would list out all of these things that I was expected to do. And then at the end of that list, there would be this little asterisk. You know what that means means, oh, by the way, anything else I tell you to do, that, that is typical of youth pastors. That is what a slave was. You did whatever that person told you to do. But there were benefits you received from there. And Paul, if, if you read the scriptures, Paul talks extensively about how you should treat slaves if you have slaves. But it's not the same type of understanding that we have of slaves where somebody was taken from their, their home and, and hauled off to a different land and sold into servitude. And so he, 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 he shifts to an idea that they understand. And we need to understand that a lot of the slaves that, that they had in the New Testament... A lot of the slaves, while they were slaves, in fact, I think if you, if you, the old King James, actually, by the way, they changed King James. The old King James didn't call them slaves. They called them servants. Kind of changes the idea there a little bit. But the fact is, they were pretty much slaves. But most of the time, 
they were treated decently. They weren't whipped like we think uh, of what used to happen in our country. They, they chose to be where they were to meet a need. That was the idea a lot of a lot of the slaves that you have in the New Testament. Were some of them abused? Absolutely. That's why Paul had to address the situation. But you need to understand, you need to understand this because what Paul says next is directly relates to that idea. Verse um, 19. Actually, let's go back all the way up and read verse 15 again. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? But you can be a slave to, uh, you can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves to sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from the slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteousness. So, here's the question. What's the, if you're a slave to sin or a slave to God, what's the difference? You're still a slave. Right? I mean, you're still a slave. If, you're, if, if you either choose to be a slave to sin or you choose to be a slave to God, what's the difference? Okay, let's put aside eternity for a minute. And, and, and let's look at being a slave to sin and being a slave to God in our earthly life. And how that plays out. You're a slave to sin and you sin and... You do things you, that, that aren't necessarily right or good. Um, you follow every lust that you have. Maybe even cheat people. Where does that lead? Remember, again, eternity aside, where does that lead you? Some fun here and there, right? A little bit of pleasure. Right? Are you ever satisfied? You're never satisfied. Just, you always want something more. That's the way sin works. If in, I read, uh, I did a, a research paper on the effects of pornography within the church. And one of the things that it talked about was left unchecked, pornography never stays with just pornography. It always infiltrates your life in another form. If left unchecked. And that is the way with every sin. Lying, cheating, stealing, you name it. If left unchecked, that it grows exponentially. And what we have to realize is that nothing we do when we are living in our sinful life is going to bring us the satisfaction that we crave. You buy a new car, how long are you happy with that car? Until you get used to it. Some people it's a year, some people it's six months. Some people say, well, I'm just going to keep this car because I can't afford a new car payment. But that is not satisfaction. That is just you realizing that you can't buy a new car because you can't afford it. There's no satisfaction in that. Sin never brings satisfaction. It brings a desire for more. In this earthly life, service to Jesus, being a slave to righteousness, being a slave to God brings satisfaction. It brings contentment that you can never find. When you choose to follow after sin. There's a lot of other things. But that's the biggest thing. The biggest difference that you will find between being a slave to sin and being a slave to God. Here on this earthly life. Is where you will never be satisfied with sin. 
But we have even greater, a, a greater reason to follow after God, to be a slave to God. And here's, 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 think of it this way. Think of it this way. How many people have ever rented a car before? Right? You know, let's assume that you rent this car and, and you pay the extra for getting the insurance. Because you know they like to, to grab money from you any way they can. Um, by the way, if you have the right insurance, believe it or not, your insurance company will cover your car. So you might want to check into that. Um, but you have this, this rental car. And if you're like me, maybe you're not like me. But when I get in a rental car, I am not too concerned about how I treat it. Okay? I, I don't try and destroy it by any means, but you know what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to go and change the oil. I'm not going to go rotate the tires. I'm definitely not going to put new tires on it. You know what? I am not going to run it through the car wash before I turn, return it. I'm, I just don't. Do any of you guys do that? If you do, bless your heart. Because they're going to wash it after you take it back anyway. Bless your heart. Where did that come from? Have I ever used that word before up here? I don't know. Why don't we, why don't we, why don't we spend effort on a, a, a loner? Because it's not something that is permanent for us. It's temporary. We're going to give it back. We're not going to keep it. We don't invest in that car because we know we won't get a return on our investment. And yet, that is how we view these bodies. These bodies are like a rental car. We're only going to have them for a little while. At best, 100, 110 years. At, I mean, that, that, somebody's laughing. Like <laughs> Somebody, I guess, is expecting to live to 125. More power to them. Uh, Rental cars. And when we sin, what we're doing is we're investing in a rental car. We're investing in this instead of investing in a car back home. That at some point in time, we're either going to have to give up, trade in. I've, I've mentioned this before. Um, when I grew up, when I was growing up, we were... We were, we were poor. Um, and so we went from used car to used car to used car. And most of the time, our used cars were, we were working on the third and fourth owner of that used car. And sure, we could spend a lot of money putting on those and keeping those cars running. But in reality, what would be the benefit? And that's the question I, I want to ask is, what is the benefit of, of investing in this body? Remember, this body is only going to be around for give or take 100 years. And we spend so much time investing in this body and fail to invest in the thing, our spirit, the thing that is going to be around forever. So how do we, how do we live the life that God has called us to live? You have this, this, this body, this flesh. You have this spirit. How do, you, how do you get one to win? How do you get one to overcome the other? So... Uh, Jimmy Graham, <clears throat> or Billy Graham, not Jimmy Graham, Billy Graham. Where did Jimmy come from? Billy Graham uh, used to use this illustration, and, it, and it, it's perfect. So there's a man who had two dogs, and they were fighting dogs. And he took them, and he would take them, and he would bet on them in a fight. And every time he picked one of those dogs, that dog would win. And they were like, man. You, you're pretty good. How, how do you know? How do you know 
Every time you, you bring your dog, you pick the one that wins. How do you know it's going to win? And he's real simple. I pick the one I feed. Ask yourself, do you want the spirit to win? Do you want to be a slave to God as opposed to a slave to sin? Ask yourself, which one are you feeding? Here's a here's a here's a checkup I want you to I want you to ask yourself. And this is just this is for you to to ask yourself this question and really contemplate this question because it's very important. Am I serving God more diligently than I served sin before I was saved? Am I serving God more diligently then I served sin before I was saved. If your answer is no or I don't know, you need to ask yourself what you need to change. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. And, and in that, you can't flip back and forth between masters. If you've ever had to work under two bosses, you can't do it. One's telling you one thing, one's telling you something else. It's impossible to satisfy either one of them. So ask yourself, what do I have to do to serve God as diligently as I served sin before I was saved? And let me give you one last nugget of truth before I close in prayer. And that is this. You will never defeat sin by stop sinning. You will never defeat sin by trying to stop sinning. You will only defeat sin by strengthening your spirit. By feeding the spirit instead of feeding the flesh. So how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we become slaves to God? Well, let me, let me give you three. I want you, I want you to do three things. Here's three things that I want you to do this, this week. And, and, and do them every day. Okay? Maybe you already do even more than this. That's great. Keep it up. But I want, you to do, I want you to do three things. I'm going to call them the, the three tens. Okay? I want you every day to read minimum ten verses in your Bible. Ten verses each day. Second, I want you to spend minimum ten minutes Set aside 10 minutes a day. I think you should be praying all day, every day. On your way to school, on your way to work, uh, on your way to the grocery store, you could just start praying. This is something a little different. I want you to set aside 10 minutes where you just go and you get into a closet, you get in by yourself somewhere, and you just spend 10 minutes talking to God. And then I want you, the, th the third thing that I want you to do is I want you to, every day, list ten things or, or, or tell God ten things you're thankful for. Don't include that in your ten minutes of prayer. And don't repeat the same ten things every day. I know some of you are tempted to do that. I want to clarify that so you don't come back. Well, you didn't say I couldn't do that. These are, these are steps that will help you start feeding the spirit instead of feeding 
the flesh. And don't stop with what I tell you to do. Talk to God. Find out what else. God, what do you want me to do? What else do you want me to do? Maybe I encourage you to be here on Wednesdays. We have a pretty good Bible study on Wednesday nights. The youth do some cool stuff. The kids do whatever the kids do. If you want to be the person that God wants you to be, you will never be that trying to stop sitting. You will only be that by feeding the Spirit. So let's, let's, let's spend our life being slaves, slaves to God. Not only for the earthly rewards we find, but for the eternity that we will someday find and, and experience. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. You speak to us in many different ways. We thank you for your word. Even, even though sometimes it's difficult to understand, sometimes it's difficult to live out. I just pray right now that, you're, that you would reach into people's hearts. You would build in them a desire to follow after you. Help them feed their spirit and starve their flesh so that they become more and more like you. We love you. We thank you. We need you. We pray that you go with us. In your name, amen. All right. Hey, thanks for being here. Love you guys. Be blessed. We'll see you on Wednesday.